I think you hit it by accident. Um, vital signs, um, you know, the most recent lab work is jotted down, um, the belongings, that are, all the different piercings that are out of their body, you know, no matter where they are, um, but all they have on is a patient gown, no underwear. Um, and it's crucial at this time to identify any needs that the patient might have. Perioperative checklist, or flow sheet sometimes it's called, it's important that that has to be completely done before they enter the OR suite, the OR room. And for consent, it's not the role of the nurse, the, the surgeons, that's the surgeon's role. The role of the is to make sure the patient has all the information they need and that they understand it. <clears throat> and it's the nurse's responsibility that the patient, um, to know that the patient's making an informed decision, that they have all the information that they need to know. The patient has the right to refuse surgery, um, even when death is, is a risk of refusal. Um, but death is often one of the risks that they put down um, on the informed consent that has to be signed. Um, on page 277, there's a, um, it, it, it was too blurry to put on a slide, um, is a, an example of the, um, informed consent, um, what, what it says and what it does. Informed consent, um, the patient autonomously and cognitively grants permission for the surgeon to do the surgery. They get the benefits, they get the risks of the procedure, they get alternatives that can be done. Like, you know, you can live this long on these cardiac meds, but if you got this surgery, here's what could happen. So they, they give all the pros and cons, they give alternatives. Informed consent is in writing. It should explain, I'm so sorry, I'm going to wait on. Come on, I just, I think I'm a little lost, that's all. We're only on the third or so slide, oh, right? Sorry, sorry. Okay. So, you said something, I thought the first thing you said. Informed consent's going to have the explanation of the procedure, mm -hmm. description of benefits and alternatives. Um, it's going to, um, the, the surgeon, once they explain everything, is going to ask if there's any questions um, about the procedure that the patient has. Um, and the, the surgeon will give instructions um, to the patient regarding what needs to be done to withdraw the consent. Notice they, they signed consent, they thought about it, they saw something on TV that you know people are suing because they got the surgery or whatever the case, or they heard it from a family member, oh no, don't do that so-and-so and Jenny died or something, you know. So um, you can retract <coughs> informed consent. So 
So can I know if you have stars on yours? You do. I, I, I'm hoping it, I know Mike loves stars. Hmm. We'll put some uh, stars on some of the important things. Um, here's all the things that need to be on the important consent. Name, type, and reason for the surgery. Name of the surgeon to perform the surgery. Reason that the intervention will benefit the patient. <clears throat> All the alternatives, potential outcomes if the surgery is not performed, consent for anesthesia, consent for blood products. Sometimes anesthesia consent is separate, um, but sometimes it's on the same informed consent. The um, pre op nurse is, is the person who makes sure that the patient understands all this information. An incompetent patient is somebody who's not autonomous. They cannot give or withhold consent. Um, cognitively impaired patients, mentally ill, neurologically incapacitated. Um, you 17 or younger, you can't consent. But emancipated minors can, you know, women that have had kids under the age of 18. Um, people that have emancipated from their parents for whatever reason can give consent. Patient's signature has to be witnessed by somebody who can be a nurse. <clears throat> the nurse in the pre op area knows that a complete informed consent includes which of the following. A, B. A, B. Could be C. C. Um, e, e, that's e. it. There's no telling it's D, guys. discharge training by assessing patients' need for post-operative transportation and care. Some pre-admission testing can be up to 12 weeks prior to the surgery, which I think is not supposed to labs change, vital signs change, assessments change, but. So pre-op nurse has <coughs> what role does she or he have in obtaining consent for anesthesia? Just ensuring that they understand, the patient understands. This is a select all. What assessments should you report to the surgeon? We didn't talk about this, but just thinking about what we learned in fundamentals. What do you think? Definitely B. Because why? Aspirin is blood thinner, good. Blood pressure, okay? Hell no. So A and B, sinus rhythm is normal, so that's okay, C, E, D, times a little elevated, and D is okay, right? Okay. Yeah, barely. So A, B, and E. Pre-op nurse is admitting a patient for same-day surgery. What's the priority? C, 
it's safe. That's the priority. Um, complete the free out the checklist. Um, B is a close second. D is a, also a close second. <laughs> um, and sense parameter, that's something that we'll talk about. Um, everything that patients are going to need to know postoperatively need to be taught preoperatively because there might be loopy postoperatively, they might be drowsy, they, they're going to be in pain most likely. So a lot of teaching, all the teaching should be done preoperatively in order for that to comply with what needs to be done postop. Patients worried about postop pain, what are some things that the nurse could teach? A. A. Yep. B. 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 Good. See, good. No, no. Um, if it was, I mean, it's abdominal surgery, not anything respiratory. So D and E are good to know, but not focus on the pain. Okay. Timeouts and pause for a pause. Um, pause for a pause. The textbook talks about. Um, I haven't heard of that. Um, I also don't work in an OR, um, but in, in diff different um, like seminars and conferences I've been to, I've never heard of a pause for a pause. Do they do that? At, 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 That's timeout, yeah. It's usually timeout, yeah. Um, starts when the patient enters the surgical facility. Um, they receive the wristband identifying their important information, and the patient <coughs> will confirm that it's all correct. A timeout is performed again when they go to the surgical suite, um, immediately preceding the incision by the entire team. So the timeout is really important to um, identify what the surgery is, that the patient knows what the surgery is, that they know what side of their body is being worked on. Um, you know, there's only one part, but if it's left lung, right lung, right knee, left knee, it's very important. Um, there have been wrong site surgeries. There have been surgeries on wrong patients over the years across the country. That's why the Joint Commission, one of the reasons why they had those national patient safety goals is because <coughs> these things have happened. Okay. And the uh, state of Pennsylvania requires a surgeon to mark. Yes, and some hospitals have the policy of having the patient mark it. Like the patient will have the Sharpie in their hand and the patient will mark their left knee or their right knee, whatever the case may be. Um, so that depends on hospital, but yeah, they, they need the mark to be, so everybody knows what's going on and there's no screw up really. <coughs> Components of a timeout. It's going to vary, but the, the, the concept is going to be the same everywhere. Um, even though a timeout was made when the patient entered the, full, entered the OR suite, there's going to be other timeout before the incision's made because the, the, that you're, if the incision's made and it wasn't the right spot, then that's a big no, no. Just basically making sure everyone knows you're on the same page, right? Yes. And, That's and, it. And that, I mean, at that point, everybody needs to know that they're on the same page um, because once they open, that's when they're going to start the night one with body parts and whatnot. You just can't be haphazardly um, removing a left kidney when their right kidney is cancerous. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's happened. It's crazy that it's happened, but it's happened. Um, it's one of those, did we talk about never events when we talked about safety last semester? Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those never events. You know, you, you can't have a patient be operated on the wrong body part, or you can't operate on the wrong patient. You know, that's why they did the birth, you ask them. The patient's reading their uh, IV band to you, the patient, uh, we're reading the IV band. Um, we do triple checks with blood products because if somebody gets the wrong blood product, it's just so, so, such a, Reactions and you know death is a problem with with adverse reactions to blood products. So. <clears throat> For a 
patient assessment. Um, medical history is very important. Um, taking note of any conditions that are contributing to the um, operation that's about to happen. Um, surgical and anesthesia history, you know, what surgeries have they had, how have they um, dealt with them, were there any complications, did they ever have complications with anesthesia. Previous surgery to the same body part might have had have left scar tissue, so they might have to, um, it might be harder to incise that area if there's scar tissue in that area. There might be internal adhesions, there might be um, equipment that's in there from a previous surgery um, that everybody needs to know about. Age, the very young, the very old um, are going to have delayed wound healing because of either immature immune systems or um, immune systems that don't work as well as they used to for the elderly. Elderly have decreased liver and kidney functions, so they're, um, the processing of the anesthesia um, is going to be problematic in a lot of cases. You want to see what their chronic conditions are, any mobility issues are. And allergies. All allergies must be documented to ensure patient safety. Allergies to all medication, dyes, latex, adhesives, environmental conditions must be documented. What's a big allergy that people worry about? In latex. That latex um, also um, iodine. Um, iodine is often used to clean the area that's about to be incised. Um, in non-surgery but procedurally, um, it's a dye, a contrast dye. Uh, iodine is in that too. Imaging. Shellfish, yeah. Although I, um, I had an overnight stay in the hospital about a month ago. Um, I was dehydrated and my potassium was low. So because I was seeing a cardiologist at St. Mary's, that's where I ended up going. I drove all the way from here to St. Mary's because I wasn't going there. <laughs> um, I didn't want to go to Tars because so I have too many old students working in the ER there. So I'm like, St. Mary's is like fancy. Um, but my cardiologist never saw me there, but I was seeing him because my family doctor heard PVCs before Christmas. So I was actually going to be discharged from him soon anyway. And I did discharge him with this new problem. So I, I was having all these cardiac <coughs> symptoms with my K of 2.9. Um, and they wanted me to have a CAT scan to rule out a pulmonary embolus because I was short of breath with minimal exertion and my heart rate was like 110 to 130 throughout the day. Um, and I said, hey, I'm allergic to shellfish. And she's trying to talk me into having this thing. I said, I'm in the middle of the allergy testing. I, I have to get blood work done. I have to do a 24 hour urine. I'm a mess. I know. I said, well, this crap wrong with me. Um, I said, uh, they're not sure if I'm allergic to it or not. I'm like, well, shellfish and iodine is different. I said, I'm not having a thought. Simple as that. Um, and I, you know, by that point, they, I knew my kid was 2.9. They knew it. But, you know, the more I have good insurance, maybe, the more procedures I get, the more the hospital bill gets hyped up. And I get that. The hospitals have to make money, but I don't know, and I don't want to feel like crud being allergic to iodine. I was actually inhaled iodine before I had an allergic reaction. I know I had gloves on, I, I know I didn't touch it, so I think I just inhaled it. But anyway, that's just my brief story. But I was really surprised, you know, with that allergy, and, and you know, that's an incomes question all the time, you know, uh, the brother re in the relate, relation to shellfish, in relation to iodine, and procedures. It, it's You'll see it. You'll still see it on MTI for this class even probably. But I was really surprised how they were really adamant on like the, the CAT scan test, I'm not sure what her title was. And then when I got back down to the ER after refusing the um, physician's assistant. <coughs> I'm like, very strange. I'm like, I'm sorry, what was it? Oh, I get it. The chest x-ray was fine. I'm like, okay, great. Then we don't need the CAT scan. They couldn't do it without content? Um, they were going to give me like Benadryl IV before that. To, they didn't suggest to see that contrast. Crazy. Because they could 
still run their tests. Yeah, we do Benadryl cocktails all the time. It's just done it without contracts. Without your insurance payment. If that's what they were worried about. I can't wait to get. Um, a survey. Yeah. <laughs> I was there from 5.30 on a Monday night till about 4.30 Tuesday at the morning. My day shift nurse from 7 a.m. to when she discharged me by just handing me discharge papers. I don't tell anybody I'm a nurse ever. So she had no idea I'm a nurse. Just handed me to them and I signed them. Like, didn't explain anything. Nothing. She did not assess me from 7 a.m. to 4 30. She came in at quarter to 10 to give me my medication. Um, she said, Oh, I didn't want to wake you up earlier because you were so soundly sleeping. So, therefore, I knew even when I was sleeping, she didn't assess me. You know what I mean? Because, you know, people would do that because they're just good people. They need to wake somebody up and just not accost them when they're sleeping. But I was like, I'm like, really, was really surprised that that happened. You know what and I mean? the physician didn't see me. I, I, I didn't feel. Like the physician's assistant or nurse practitioner, like they're, why didn't the physician at least say, have fun on the unit, like when I'm leaving or something? Like I, I was very surprised that I didn't get a physician to even look at me. Huh? Well, the, the PA was working under the physician probably, so. I don't know if they allow it. And it's funny, but so, like, I'm, and I'm not used to this because I've been out of the hospital for probably 13 years, 14 years. The biller came up and, and, and took my payment. Luckily, I had my check card with me. You know, or actually, my benefits card it says like uh, flexible benefits. Yeah. So I use that. It was like right before I was being discharged. And I didn't want to wait for it. I didn't need a wheelchair. So I said, I can walk down. I said, but I really don't know where to go. This hospital is very big and I've never been in here before. <coughs> never was in there before. So she, my nurse walked me down at least. So that was nice. But no assessment. And she gave me cardiac meds. She was using the nurse's aides, vital signs from like 6 a.m. I'm sure. I mean, I don't take my own blood pressure med. I don't take my blood pressure before I take my blood pressure med. But still, and I think because I was on a telemetry unit and they saw my heart rhythm and they could see my pulse, and that's it. Because I wasn't had, I didn't have an A-line for a blood pressure or anything. I think people's mindset are, okay, she's breathing, she has a heartbeat. I don't have to assess her. That's just so weird. What medications are they on? What medications will um, affect the uh, 